Hello and welcome to Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation with your host Peter Tung. Thank you for joining us today. Apologies if I sound a little bit nasal, I've got a, a little bit of a head cold, but I'm in great spirits as I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with my guest today, Neil Kramer, who returns to the show this year, almost exactly a year ago actually. I, I was thinking about this big event, December 21st, 2012, last year and all the hype around that and I was thinking, who are the four people I trust most in this world to give us uh, some spiritual understanding of what we perhaps need to do at this time? And Neil Kramer was, was top of that list and, and came on the show the last week in November last year. And so I'm delighted to welcome Neil back to the show. And uh, Neil, perhaps you could begin by telling us what your experience has been uh, over this last year since uh, we spoke a year ago. All I, could, all I would say is that the cracks are opening. That is my summary of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of things. Perhaps you could explain that then. I would. I would. I will indeed, yeah. I, I would say that in 2012, there was a real critical mass achieved where people who were positioning their growth outside of themselves faced real challenges. So all those who were seeking instruction and methodology and wisdom and guidance and redemption and uh, you know, saving from an external source of any description, not just the religious folks, but a lot of the New Ages and a lot of the mainstream people, those people faced a blank space. And when they stared into that, uh, what was mirrored back to them was their own kind of denial so those little hairline cracks that had been they'd been wallpapering over <laughs> for the last 20 or 50 years or whatever suddenly it opened up into these canyons these big profound canyons uh, that ask questions about what are you doing in your life are, are you growing are you fulfilled are you with the person you should be with are you doing what you should be doing are you living in the right place and all those really foundational questions that are ours to decide for our own lives demanded an answer. And I think that has really, really um, taken shape over 2013. And as I, as I said previously on this, I, I've, I've not seen this level of change in the last 20 years in people's personal lives. And I think it's an extremely positive and, um, you know, it's like an engine that has been put into a different gear and suddenly you know the speed is accelerated and I, I think it's very good and for all those people who thought december 21st 2012 was was her going to herald in a a great time for the future it's been a pretty challenging year and, and what you've just spoken about these these great canyons these great uh, openings in our systems yeah. it's still going on isn't it it is and for somebody somebody might think well what a dreadful thing that there are these chasms opening up and things will fall into them and it's 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 dreadful and it's difficult but as you use the word yourself other people see them as openings and say well hmm, you know maybe this is an opportunity to get rid of some stuff that doesn't work and to disabuse ourselves of some notions of holding on to politics and holding on to uh, bad philosophy and bad dogma and realizing that we can't daydream anymore about things just getting better while we watch them from the sidelines. That clearly isn't going to happen. So this time shows us that you really have to do it. You can't just keep talking about it and reading about it. You actually have to do it. You have to tie your boot laces on, you know, get, get your walking stick like Bilbo Baggins and get out there and actually do things. And that that is inescapably the case now so a lot of dreamy folk have been roused from that daydream and shown quite a stark light and I, and I see that as just purely an excellent thing because everything that can't stand up to that you know is 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 shrinking back from that and you have to ask questions when that happens and those who are benefiting from that clarity can think, right, well, this is it. This is the time that I take some risks, do some things that I've always known I needed to do, but which I'd been putting in second place because I'd been dreaming about this new age um, redemption. And it's, it's, not, it's not here. It's not true. 
So whilst there's a disappointment in that, there's also a great opportunity, a great liberty to actually create something of value in life. So let's talk a little bit about some of those things that, that don't work, that people were relying upon and believing would, would lead them to salvation. Just talk about what some of those things are. Well, I would say anything where there's a, a dogma, where there's a set, of, a set of instructions, philosophies, ideologies that say, this is the way to do it. Because and many human beings who don't have confidence in themselves and don't have strength of character and don't have quality of being, they prefer to be told what to do. And the manipulators of this world, both the terrestrial and ultra-terrestrial, the normal and the extraordinary, whoever is manipulating, it's always a, a very handy thing to realize that your target audience likes to be controlled. Right? So when I look around and people are moaning about the, the state of affairs and the cataclysms and the dreadfulness of British and American and European governments, I just think, well, what are you doing about it? What are you doing to create a better world? Not in your, in your head, inside that skull, but what are you actually physically doing in life to make changes? How is that, how is that affected in your personal life, what are you doing? Not on a forum, not on the internet, but what are you actually doing? So I, th I think it, it spurs growth, this realization that that external weirdness is not entirely separate from us. So more and more people uh, in England, you know, friends and family and colleagues and people I've known for a long time and new people are totally disenfranchised from David Cameron's, uh, you know, just sort of candy store government over there, which is just laughably inept. And all these Tory politicians who are just as dreadful as the Labour ones, it's, it's just people can't watch it anymore. So all those who used to watch, do you remember Question Time on TV, Peter? Yeah, I do, yes. Yeah. And, and the, you, you would consider that 20 years ago of being involved in the public conversation about politics in British life. Now that is unwatchable because it's just palpably untrue and inauthentic and dishonorable so the reading the newspapers the independent and the telegraph and the guardian and the times in britain nonsense it's all nonsense because it's hopelessly disconnected from truth and honor and purity it doesn't mean anything so we are finding ourselves going into our own study of truth and real news about the world, not mainstream news, because that isn't news about the world at all. It never constitutes news. And so it gives people the imperative to go out and find out what is occurring in your life, in your family, in your community, in your city, in your uh, country, and how are you connected to that? And, and so what the brokenness spurs growth. So in terms of uh, getting to that point where, where we are now and have been over the course of this last year, how, how are you advising people to handle these great canyons that have opened up in their world? And, and what, apart from what you've just said about being, you know, moving into action, but specifically from each person's individual perspective, what, what is the way for them to move into a place of peace and happiness? Well, only they can know that. I can't know that for anyone except myself, so I, I can't answer that question. But I, I know what you mean when you say that. It's like, what, can we, what practicalities can we observe? What can we do? And what are some kind of guidelines and tips and whatnot? And if that's, if that's what you're saying, then I would certainly say that if you consider yourself as an authority in terms of your own life, that has an enormous influence because I'll tell you, most people do not consider themselves an authority on anything, really. And so when they're looking for what is happening, let's forget the mainstream. What is happening significantly in um, the mainstream world? What is happening significantly in our life? Then you have to consider yourself as the arbitrator of truth in that. So as soon as you place authority outside of yourself as onto a spiritual leader or a guru or some kind of ascended master or some special figure, you, 
you disconnect yourself from your own growth and your own discovery. So what I would cons- what I would tell people to consider is contemplate the idea that the more you position yourself as the authority of truth in your life, the more truth you'll be able to make contact with and handle, and the more excellence you'll be able to manifest in your own life. So that's a little bit abstract, but it that's the what I do. It ask people to contemplate who is the authority on spiritual truth in your life. And for most people, the answer is not themselves. Now, I know one of the things we've talked about previously, Neil, is, is, is the risk or the danger of doing this work and then accumulating enormous amounts of information and knowledge mm. to try to understand what's going on. What, what do you say to that? Well, it's a funny thing, isn't it? There's, there's so much knowledge out there now. You know, radio shows, podcasts, interviews, video clips and movies. Everybody's making movies now, aren't they? And forums, millions and millions and millions of pages of forums. And the, the volume of media goes on increasing exponentially because anyone with a cell phone can create and publish media, which is good and weird at the same time. So... You know, gladly we have people like yourself, wise arbitrators like Peter Tong and Henrik Palmgren and Mel Fabregas and all these different people who will root out the nonsense and present to us, you know, reasonably credible, interesting, thought-provoking guests who bring interesting ideas to the table. But what about newcomers who, who haven't found people like you and just go out there and encounter this endless, you know, cataclysm prophecies and charlatans and miracle cures and you know who are we to listen to who are we to trust you know who knows who really knows something about life who really knows something special and valuable and who doesn't who are those pretending to know but are really just trying to be okay in themselves or special or recognized and how can we tell the difference between a man of honor and high conduct and, and living philosophy and a pretender. So this volume of knowledge presents us with those unique uh, opportunities to increase our discernment. And my suggestion to people is that we can tell the difference by the quality of somebody's being. We can tell by how they conduct themselves, not by the knowledge, not by their information, not by the data, not by the stories they tell, but by their deportment, their humor, their warmth, their roundedness as a human being, their balance. And if any of that is out of kilter, then you need to stick a post-it note on that person and say, well, good knowledge, but low fidelity being, if you get me. You know, they're still caught in pain or ego or illusion or something. So when I'm looking for somebody now of quality... I'm not really interested in the knowledge because anyone can do that. Knowledge is is to a penny. What I'm looking for is quality of being that demonstrates wisdom, applied knowledge. That's what I'm looking for. And you can sniff it. You can tell it in a person a mile off. So, you know, I'm not just saying this, but you clearly have a quality of being that differentiates you from many hosts who do not. They're just throwing data out. But when you have to live it and you have to grow, and you have to transform, the wisdom becomes part of your communication. It becomes part of your conversation. So when you and I were having a chat before the show, we're doing the same thing we're doing now, aren't we? Absolutely. You know, we're not talking differently. We're doing the same thing. Absolutely. And Neil, we're actually at our first break, so we'll we'll take that now and uh, return in a moment. It's Peter Tung for Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation. Welcome back to Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation with your host, Peter Tung. Thank you for joining us today. Just a reminder to go to my website, www.petertung.com, where you will see uh, our recent newsletters and all the radio guests, over 230 interviews now. It's a compendium of much wisdom, as, uh, as Neil indicated a little bit uh, in the last segment. Uh, and also a reminder that I'm now doing these uh, Thursday morning live meditations at 11.30 Pacific. And the beautiful thing is that you can listen live or you can listen archived through an MP3, which we will send to you. So if you're interested in that, just go to uh, the events page on my website, www.petertongue.com. And also to visit www.myheartcenteredjourney.com. 
and our Ambassadors of Light class, where I give uh, an update every couple of weeks about what is happening in the world from my perspective, energetically, astrologically, and spiritually. And I actually have a class uh, tomorrow evening beginning at 5.30 Pacific. So we return now with Neil Kramer, who gave us a wonderful first segment uh, talking to us about where we are in the world today and perhaps what we might want to think about doing in the next phase of our existence on this beautiful planet. And Neil, you, you used the word fidelity in, uh, in your description. I'd love you to just expand on what you mean by that. Well, fidelity for old people, you might think of it, uh, <laughs> like me, you might think of it as something to do with your vinyl, you know, your LPs from the old days. <laughs> so fidelity, it talks about quality and talks about the, um, you know, the kind of frequency and resonance and value of a, of a piece of audio, say. Um, but we also associate it with fidelity in relationships of loyalty of faith and so on and so forth so when i'm talking about fidelity it's it's like the fidelity of a piece of music so it could be an old crackly thing or it could be a pristine perfect high quality you know blu-ray recording or whatever so fidelity in that respect i sometimes use that word in consideration of somebody's behavior so it's lo-fi or hi-fi right so if I'm with someone, just think, what an incredible person. The fidelity of their being is very high. It's very pure. They're very present. And when they communicate with me, I can feel them. And I look at them, and they're here in the room. They're not just talking. They're not thinking of something in the future or the past. They're here, present. So that is high fidelity. Low fidelity is where the person is really just moving the mouth and saying things and thinking about the past and the future and caught up in just cerebral computing processing. And it's just, it's just not, it's not no good for me anymore, that. So the fidelity of being is very, is very critical. So if you have a high fidelity of being, people acknowledge that. They enjoy proximity to your being, your presence, so just like when you stood with somebody sometimes, you must have experienced, you just think, I don't know what it is about this person, a guy or a girl, young or old, it doesn't matter. I just, I just love being near them. They make me feel better. They uplift me. They cl clarify things. It's just good. That is fidelity of being. And, and what we're talking about today uh, largely is about the, the quality of beingness that we, that we live by, that we embrace, that we, our essence so, so continue talking about quality of beingness uh, and, and its critical um, moments in time now. Well, we said, didn't we, in the beginning that knowledge is, uh, is, is kind of limited, is finite. We, we need to accumulate knowledge to get to a certain threshold. So you'll, you'll find that a lot of people are very hungry for knowledge for a while. They have this great appetite and they read this and listen to this and watch this and blah, 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 blah. And Sooner or later, whether it's years or decades, one reaches a point, and everyone I speak to does this, where that begins to recede a little, and you become more discerning about, well, I'll listen to Peter Tong, obviously, always do that, <laughs> and I'll read this book by this guy, and I'll listen to this you know, radio show on NPR or something, and I'll watch that show, but everything else, forget it. You know, that I'm swamped with information, and that knowledge is useless, useless without being. And I'm defining being, again, in a very particular way, as what I would say is a perfect balance of the, the three wills, of animal will, soul will, and divine will, which is something I go into in a, a workshop that I'm, uh, I've just put on the website, which I'll tell you about a bit later. So the animal will, the flesh having a real presence on this planet, being here, being Peter Tong, being Neil Kramer, as a, a perfect physical being, to be, to be deep in the mortal adventure, to be alive and to have form. That's the animal will, okay? We all have that. The soul will, the subtle or ethereal will, to be aware that your higher consciousness is not generated from within your animal biology. It is, for all intents and purposes, something outside of you 
in another place. It is connected. It is immortal. It is luminous, right? So that is your soul will. Divine will is, is a big question. It is source emanation from source inside our, to the place inside our center, inside our core. So it is a connection from our core deep inside us to the core of the universe, to its origination. And it's a link back home, I would say. And it is the original emanation from the source, from the divine, from God, if you like, that guides us in our growth, our excellent conduct, and our creational power. So being is the, is the confluence of those three things, of animal being, of soul being, and of divine being. And that is the aim of being as well, to have these three wills breathing together, flowing together in every moment. And so those three factors constitute an authentic human being. Nothing extraordinary when we're speaking of the natural circumstances. However, in this world that is, does have a brokenness at the present time, those three factors are extraordinary. And when they are harmonically positioned together as one, we get this incredible fidelity of being. This magic opens up in the world. It's not just a world of things and processes and nuts and bolts, as Richard Dawkins would love us to feel. That's just not true. If it was, I'd admit it and say, well, it is, but it isn't. We're not just here to pass on our genetic material. We're here to contribute and witness in this divine unfoldment of the work in progress of creation. We're part of that. It's not finished. It's not a finished work. It's not a finished piece. It's a work in progress. And its refinement is something that we're involved in. So in terms of, of, of creating this balance between those three, I know, what, for example, one of the things that, that I've come across with people on a spiritual journey or a spiritual pilgrimage is a tendency to think that uh, their um, solution is to, to travel out of body and have incredible experiences and dreams and so on. And they've almost forgotten that they exist on this planet in a physical form for a very important reason. The most important thing in life is the physical animal flesh, period. That's the most important thing in this life. Right here, right now, anyone ignoring that is dreaming, is dreaming and needs a slap in the face with a big <laughs> fish, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they do. They really do because they are ignoring their animal being their sacred vehicle, their holy experience, their gift, their bestowal of life. And when that gets hard, you know, people drift off, don't they, into this dream of the soul will, of the ethereal, and think, this is it. This is where I would like to create a sanctuary. Now, I understand that. I really do. And I've seen some fine people fall foul of this and bring themselves back again, because it never works. You can't escape. So anyone who is ignoring the, the flesh or ignoring the soul or ignoring the divine will go out of balance. So the duality of the animal of the physical and the soul, the non-physical, is, has been an incredible uh, philosophical, spiritual dilemma for many students for many millennia. And it is my assertion, which is not a unique, it's old wisdom, this, as all the best stuff is old. If anyone's giving lots of new stuff, it concerns me. <laughs> so when somebody brings something old and, and packages it in contemporary language, that can help. That can help. And I'm doing that with this divine will to say the way you collapse polarity is by bringing in source, which is unmanifested. It's ineffable. You always see this in um, esoteric Christian theological literature. They talk about it being unbegotten. That is not that somebody didn't have sex and produce a person, but that's the language. Unbegotten means it is unmanifested. It does not appear. It does not partake in creation. Because it doesn't need to. It created creation. So the unbegotten, there is an element of that inside us, and that's the magic thing that collapses polarity. But you have to prepare yourself physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, sexually, everything to receive that, let's call it a signal. So one's quality of being in this respect 
is far more important than one's knowledge. That knowledge does nothing to prepare you to receive and transmit and channel and embody divinity. It does nothing at all to help you do that. Far better, as you and I have discussed, is to go out into nature, be with the running water in a stream, observe the bald eagles flying through the gorge, and <laughs> be in that space purely and with your innocence and observe. And it's an age-old technique, but so, so important in a knowledge-saturated world. So it's very, very good for us to make sure that we understand there's the, that there's the physical, there's the non-physical, and then there's the thing that is unbegotten outside of it, the divine, the animal, the soul, the divine. That's the magic. That's the space where you start to see things happen. That's what separates the sage from the normal man. Otherwise, we just, we're just imagining, we're just dreaming. No, no crime, nothing wrong with that. But we haven't got infinite time here. We've got a certain amount of physical presence, and it is rather good for us to use it wisely. Thanks so much, Neil. I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to the, the bald eagle and gorge when we come, and, and when we come back. It's Peter sure. Tung for Awakening <laughs> to Conscious Co-Creation. Welcome back to Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation with your host, Peter Tung. Thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for this series of shows. Sherry Chase at Chase International Real Estate Company in beautiful Lake Tahoe and Reno, Nevada. And also to thank Brandy Jackson of Voice America, my producer, and Matt, who is our regular production engineer for the show every Wednesday at noon. Uh, and to thank them for providing this opportunity for me to have such uh, wonderful guests on the show uh, including our guest today, Neil Kramer. So I just want to uh, comment upon Neil's comment about the beautiful bald eagle flying down the gorge because I moved this last weekend into a new small apartment and I am now actually, while recording this show, overlooking this beautiful waterway which is called the Gorge Waterway. It looks like a, a nice flowing broad river but it's actually an inlet from the sea and so it actually fills in and flows out twice a day. And so you get, instead of the flow of the river, you get the flow in both directions. And of course, there is uh, a moment in time when there is absolute stillness, <sighs> when nothing is moving at all. And I have not yet experienced that, but I'm looking forward to it. But why I'm, I'm telling this story is, is one of the key elements uh, of the work that Neil is talking about um, is the, the beauty of nature and truth. And I, I really resonate with what Neil has said about gathering all this information and knowledge and getting understanding and now getting to the point at which I now only read what I have to read for the show and very specifically uh, important pieces that come my way because that's, that's what I do. And the rest of the time, I'm going to be looking out of my window and going down to the gorge yes. and spending yes. time in nature and, yes. and just being, uh, as you have described. So I, I feel... So blessed to have moved here this week and also blessed to have you on the show today, Neil. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you, Peter, and I, and I feel uh, very privileged to be uh, having this conversation as well. Because you know why? Not just to speak with you because you're a top banana, but also <laughs> because as I know there's a lot of people out there who need to hear this, who need to have the confirmation, the affirmation, the permission, the allowance to say, yeah, it is okay. To t once, you've, once you've finished your Peter Tong show for the day, close your laptop, close your computer, take your iPod out, and, and go outside and interact with what's out there. Because that beauty is, is a marker for truth. Because a lot of people, especially young uh, students of s spiritual um, wisdom, can't quite understand what nature has got to do with metaphysical, exciting mysticism. And I'll tell you, there's a simple answer for that. Nature reflects divinity in a very pure way. And so any complex system, like an ocean or a stream, or feathers on a bird, or branches on a tree, or indentations on a boulder, anything where there's a complexity of structure, reflects divinity. And so it is a pattern of harmonization. Nature holds that pattern. And when you go into it, as long as you clear your vessel, as it were, as long as you still the mind, it will harmonize you as well. And it will prepare you and soothe you 
and encourage you and heal you without you doing anything at all. All you have to do is still the mind. So for me in my life, I have seen recently that the more, I, the more time I spend in nature, and where you and I live in a similar part of the world, don't we, in uh, the west coast, the Pacific Northwest region, from sort of Portland and Seattle and up to Victoria and Vancouver. And there's this fantastic rainforest, this arboreal forest that stretches for thousands of miles and beaches and rocks and rivers and inlets and beautiful, absolute stunning landscapes. You know the British naturalist, uh, survivalist Ray Mears, who's a, a, a fantastic guy. One of his favorite parts of the world, this. And I know why now. I understand why now because it is this fantastic climate, and I try and give myself the gift of as much time in that as possible, because it improves me as a person, not just intellectually and physically, and, you know, food for the soul and all that, but actually my mystical study is sharpened and honed and instructed by nature, instructed by nature. It's not just a way to recharge your batteries and have a bit of relaxation. It's instruction. It's instruction from a master. And the environment, as long as you learn to connect with that, which is a skill, which has to be learned and takes time. But once you get that, there is no greater and more important potency than putting yourself in the trees, on the beach, in the desert, in the rivers, in the mountains, wherever it is, even if if it's just a local park, if that's the best you can do, fine. But to find that slice of nature and be with it and become acclimatized to it is extremely important, extremely important. And it helps your, as we say, your quality of being, your fidelity of being to improve. So I'm not interested in the alternative scholar and the, the dark, you know, frowning, philosophical person that that does nothing for me anymore it's very dogmatic it's very separate from reality and it's very adversarial what i want to see is a roundness of character and i want to see someone who can smile and laugh as much as they can give insight and discernment that there is essential as each other i promise you of that as the older i get the more i see it so could you give us a, a personal example then of, of how your connection with the natural world, with nature, has, has somehow helped you on this, on this beautiful mystical journey? I can, yeah. I'll tell you a very simple example. Um, I go over to the, to the coast a lot. I'm spending more and more of my life there. It's a very special place. And here in um, northwestern Oregon, the, the rainforest spills into the ocean so that it's not beach and ocean as we might see uh, in, in Spain or Portugal or something, it, it, it's ocean where there's rocks and mountain lions that come right down to it, and it's, it's amazing. When I'm in that space, it gradually draws together the gap between waking consciousness and dream consciousness. So my, the landscape, the psychic ethereal landscape of the dream is, bre- is being... Uh, brought closer and closer into waking consciousness. And a very, very clear example of that is my ability to um, have what you might say clairvoyance or the, a, a second sight into a situation to see beyond has increased in conjunction with the time I spend in that environment. That environment is making my cultural programs, i.e. all the nonsense that society has installed into me, it's starting to dissolve it. And as that happens, my natural human psychic abilities are increasing. And that is, is absolutely correlated with being in nature. And if I drew a graph of psychic experiences and time spent in nature, it correlates all along the way for the last 24, 36 months, absolutely spot on, because I keep notes and, you know, a calendar of all this stuff. And I'm just like, wow, it's actually really, really important. 
So I'll actually uh, just add a, another story because it's not it's not my story, but it's it's a it's a beautiful story. And and one of the the gifts that we have, as you know, is working with this landscape zodiac, which yes. connects the constellations with yeah, the Earth. Yeah, fasc- fascinating. Yeah. And we were doing our Scorpio workshop a month ago, and we were walking along the breakwater, which is like. It's like the outside protector of the inner harbor, but it's also the outside protector of the left claw of the scorpion in the landscape. So we're walking along this breakwater, and it's, it's about 4 o'clock. It was the day the clocks changed, so it was gonna, the sun was going to set in half an hour, and it was just absolutely glorious and beautiful. And it became very surreal. As we walked along the breakwater, we, it felt as if we were walking into another world, another realm. And we were doing a beautiful offering to the ocean at the end of the day, and we were all blessing this aquamarine crystal, which was going to be placed inside this beautiful bread bowl, which had got flowers, blessing Mother Earth, placed in it. And as one of the women was blowing on the aquamarine crystal, sending her blessings into it, she just said, suddenly, someone take a photograph now, which she's never, ever done before. And so after we'd finished the ceremony and, and we'd sent this beautiful bread bowl out in, into the ocean, uh, I asked her why she'd asked to have the photograph taken. And she said, well... I've had two near-death experiences, and she said, and I was beginning to feel the same way in that moment that I felt in those moments, but I felt, and the word she was, I felt green. And when we looked at the photograph that was taken of her, the whole photograph was completely beautiful emerald green. And you think, wow. That is, that, that is amazing, and that is, that is a beautiful example of that harmonization process. So it kind of calibrates you to what is around you. So nothing nothing could be simpler than that experience. And yet she is, whatever she's doing, she has cleared her vessel sufficiently to allow that calibration, that harmonization to take place. Because if you're full of knowledge, if your cup of, is full of stuff and thoughts and dogma and ideas and I am a Buddhist, I am a this, I am a that, I am a philosopher, this is this, this is this cataclysm, this is this massive event. If your head is full of stuff, nature can't see you. It can't collaborate with you. It can't help you. And frankly, it may even lose interest in you because you're just a little separate entity wandering about. Whereas when you have a certain graciousness of your self and your conduct and a certain humility which is absolutely critical fundamental component of this when your self is small nature works with you if you are full of your own self-importance and your own dogma nature cannot see you it cannot work with you so whoever that lady is has clearly done the work and that feeling that arises from within can't be denied, can it? It can't because there's no point. And the more mature you get, the, the less interested you are in exaggerations or fantasy <laughs> or whatever. You don't. You just say, look, I'm telling you, make of this what you will. This is happening to me, inside me, now. It's real. It's genuine. I am sincere. I don't know what it is, but I am sharing it with you. And you can sense when the, the veracity of that in a person. Think, wow, she really means it. She really means it, and it's, it's very exciting, and it's human beings interacting with their world in a real way. And to have examples of that, like the story you just told, is very encouraging because it makes people want to go out and try it for themselves, which is brilliant. Absolutely, and that's exactly what we do every month. We just had our Sagittarius this weekend and had some similarly wonderful events take place when we come into that co-creation with uh, Mother Earth. It's wonderful. We'll take our final break now, Neil. It's Peter Tongue for Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation. Welcome back to Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation with your host, Peter Tongue. Having a wonderful discussion today with Neil Kramer. And Neil, I know you've got a new product out on your website. Just tell our listeners about that. Yeah, that is uh, called Alchemy of Will. And it is a download. It is an audio download, uh, over six hours of MP3s, uh, which cover... Uh, a workshop that I did in autumn um, earlier this year, and it's essentially about some of the things we've been talking about. It's about being, it's about will, it's about being a better man, being a better woman, it's about creating something new in life. And the esoteric is certainly covered. Very mystical, sacred, spiritual truths are explored the best way we can to examine them and unveil them. And also very practical things about relationships and art 
literature and music, things that are real in front of us that reflect those truths. So, yeah, that's, that's a brand new download. Just come out this morning on the website. People are already downloading it, I can see, which is great. And, uh, you know, it's a nice piece of work, if I don't say so myself. It's really <laughs> heartfelt. It's nicely put together. Uh, it's a lovely Q&A session with the audience. Fantastic, intelligent, super sharp audience. I had with me about 120 people. Absolutely brilliant. So anyone who is interested in what we've talked about today is going to love that. Great. And what is the website? neilkramer.com so that's n-e-i-l-k-r-a-m-e-r.com neilkramer.com and you'll see this alchemy of will picture which is a hand pressed up against a window and you'll see it. it's a nice blue image and that in itself has significance and uh, those with alchemical knowledge will appreciate what that means excellent great well good luck with that thank you so let's uh, talk about the heart yeah. the yeah. heart and the heart portal now yeah, that, that is a, an increasingly important thing, again, in, in life. Because a lot of people, um, particularly a lot of men, I'm sure you must, find, you must find this yourself, Peter, that a lot of men don't really consider the heart uh, as important in life. They, they just don't, right? They focus on mind. They emotionally live through mind. They physically live through mind. And they spiritually, metaphysically, and philosophically live through mind, right? Now, heart, forget love, forget heart, forget compassion, forget all that fluffy stuff. Heart is a piece of equipment that connects us to things. And that's all it does, in my view. And it is, it is a piece of inner technology, very, very special, very, very powerful, very profound, unique in many parts of the universe, I am, I am saying, I am feeling, I am suggesting that. And it enables us to unite with a thing. So we, the only way to truly know something is to be it, right? So the heart allows you to do that. So we associate it with love, of course, because if you're with somebody special, special man, special woman, and you get close to them, there is nothing better than that merging, not just physically and sexually, but energetically, and your very being, the edges blur, the boundaries soften, and for a moment, two entities become one. And that is a sense that we call falling in love, right? And anyone who's ever known that knows exactly what that is. It's absolutely overwhelming, overpowering, because you yourself is dissolving a little bit at the edges, and someone else is momentarily representing you and so heart is your ability to connect with something it is your spiritual wi-fi and when that sucker is on you can connect with trees rocks knowledge people music at a very profound level not by its representation not by reading about it or watching it but actually by being it so the heart is a very profound piece of gear that we have to learn and it's like a little Stradivarius violin it's just a little thing a little thing there it is it does nothing but when you get a virtuoso who is trained in it it becomes a thing of extraordinary exquisiteness right so it has to be learned how we use this thing and naturally in natural human conduct we learn the basics everybody learns the basics but from a mystical esoteric angle we learn that it also allows us to know in a much more profound way than the mind can. So heart can be equated with soul. So in my cosmology, in my methodology, just the way I do things, essentially, your soul will, its way into your being as a physical animal is through your heart. That's how you communicate with it, and that's how it can help you communicate and connect with Anything, not the mind. The mind is an essential piece of gear as well. Your mind is a very human, amazing thing, but it's not the best way to gain knowledge. So this sounds very much like the way in which the uh, shamans or the sages or druids of old will have connected to the animal kingdom. It is. How do you know about the, the fox or the eagle or the bear or the horse? You be them. You be horse, you be eagle. That's how you know about it. You have to shift into it. You have to shape shift 
not your body. I mean, you can do that. That can happen. But more importantly, your being, which is your emanation, your will, your numinosity, your numen, your divinity, your divine will, your godliness. That can assume any shape and any form as long as the mind allows it. And human society, human machine culture, that is the culture of control and manipulation, which unfortunately we've been messing around with for a couple of thousand years now at least, that society is trying to block mind from allowing that um, merging and that shifting and that flexibility. So mind has become very restricted. And so much of my work is releasing mind to allow these other things to come in. And to do that, you have to understand it. So yes, I am cerebral. Yes, I am intellectual. Yes, I am very philosophical. But the irony is only in order to liberate us from those things. It's part of the paradox, isn't it? It is. It is. You have to pick the book up and read it. You have to write your diary and your notes and your pages. You have to think and articulate and be very lucid and very eloquent as, possible, as, as you possibly can and use language to the absolute fine, you know, super sharpness that you possibly can. And then you let it go. Then you stop doing that. So it's, it's something that you run with for a certain time and then you release. And the only way we can release a thing is by knowing it. So to deconstruct something, you have to understand it inside out. So to release the heaviness of self, you have to understand self. So this is, this is what I call the philosophy of authentic being. The philosophy of being, that's what it says on the top of the website. The philosophy of being, how to be. How to think, how to feel, how to be. Ancient human wisdom that belongs to all of us. Here's one guy, Neil Kramer, who says, well, here's what I do. Take it or leave it. I don't care. If you don't like this, go away. (laughs) I don't care at all. However, I think that some of these things are sort of universal and you might enjoy them. Oh, I think, Neil, you're right on it. (laughs) I really appreciate having met you uh, a while ago, actually at the Assetti Ranch, wasn't it? And then yeah. seeing how this is all unfolding. And I, I definitely feel that you've been a catalyst in my life uh, energetically. And I uh, really appreciate that. And I appreciate your time today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But I, I really... Goodness me, that flies by, doesn't it? I know it does, yeah. So thank you so much for your, for your wisdom. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you so much. Take a deep breath. So... My guest next week is Sherry Anderson, who has written a book called Ripening Time. And she says, maturity is as complex and rich as an old vine wine, the fruit of a life lived with honesty, soul, and care for others. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with Sherry on the show next week. I hope you all have a wonderful week. It's Peter Tung for Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation.